How do you view yourself? Take a moment and really ask yourself that question. Because how you view yourself matters a great deal to how you live and the decisions that you make. Let's look at a couple of scriptures to get started with in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. It tells us to guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. In Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, it says a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or ga grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil pers person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. This passage is really helpful as we think about our subject because what we believe about ourselves, how we view ourselves, what's stored up in our hearts will come out in various ways as actions and so forth. So you think about all the decisions that are impacted because of how we view ourselves. Take some time to think about the connection between the way you view yourself and things like decisions you make about morality, what's right, what's wrong. Decisions you make about religion, decisions you make about marriage and who to marry and um, what your home is to look like and, and the family and how you raise your children, all of these things. Um, or think about the education you pursue. Perhaps where you go to school, where you go to college and such things um, that you decide. Um, and the career that you choose to pursue. Or even things like the way you dress. Or sometimes the kind of car you drive. So many things, big things and small things, result and are connected with how you view yourself. Unfortunately, most people in this world are taught to measure their sense of worth in the wrong way kind of ways. In fact, I would submit to you that the entire scale that most people use to try to measure their sense of value is deeply flawed. And between this lesson and the next lesson, we'll look uh, deeper at those things. And this has resulted in an unfathomable amount of damage that's been caused throughout this world. So what we need is a new way to view ourselves that will lead to making decisions that are actually beneficial to get to what that verse 45 talks about, that a good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. A lot of that ties back to how you view yourself. So we need that new way of viewing ourselves and determining our sense of worth. And that I want to su um, suggest to you during the course of this study is something that we can call Godfidence or God confidence. The purpose of this first lesson is to learn the ways in which people often measure their sense of worth, how Satan is spreading these standards of measurement, and some results of people living with an unbiblical view of themselves. So let's first really just evaluate the standards that are used for measuring your sense of worth. The standard that you use to matter th measure things, it, it matters. I want you just, from a purely um, human and physical standpoint, as far as an illustration goes, I want you to think about, just, just imagine going into a doctor's office, and he uses a random stick each time, varying lengths, he just grabs a stick, and that's how he what he uses to try to measure how tall you are. Um, or how tall one of your children might be. So one day he says that you're three and a quarter sticks tall. Another day he says you're five and three quarters sticks tall. Another day you're four and a half sticks tall. Now you step back and you think about those numbers. What would those numbers really mean to you? Well, if they're just random sticks, they really don't mean anything. They don't really give you an accurate picture of how you or your child or whoever is growing, does it? And unfortunately, that's what most people do throughout this world. 
they grab on to various standards of measurement to try to formulate their sense of who they are, their sense of value, their sense of worth. And none of those sticks that they're using to measure themselves, none of those standards, are actually helpful in determining their true worth. You see, what this all really boils down to is the fact that physical standards are deeply flawed. You know, we, we tend to have a um, place of significance on, on measuring things that are actually important to us. And we want to see, are we gaining in this particular area that's important to us, or are we actually losing in that particular area? And you kind of step back and you think about some of those things that we often measure. Maybe we measure our weight. We want to know, am I going the right way on the scales, or am I going the wrong way on the scales? And so we keep track of those. We maybe have a set of scales in our bathroom or something, and we want to know where we're at. Or maybe we measure our retirement savings. And so maybe we keep a fair eye on what that, those accounts are doing so we know um, if we're going to have what we need when we reach that point. We measure things that are of importance to us. And so as you measure the value of your life, you're going to either use a physical standard or one that is spiritual in nature. Of course, the overwhelming majority of people in this world use standards that are physical in nature. But Jesus teaches us that using such things to measure ourselves, they are deeply flawed. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Namely, every physical thing is only temporary in nature, while spiritual things, of course, are eternal. So using physical standards will result in making decisions that only have a temporary impact. In fact, let me challenge you to think about it in this way. If you measure your worth by things that do not last, those physical things, what does that say about your worth itself? Think carefully on that question. If you can measure your sense of worth by physical things, then it can only imply that you are not worth anything beyond when those things end. However, if something spiritual that lasts determines your worth, then your worth surpasses anything that's temporary. And so you think carefully about those things. But then in addition to just not producing an a, a truly accurate measurement of your worth, physical standards of measurement also will leave you unfulfilled and unsatisfied. Because at best, you'll realize that they're all just temporary, and you can be separated from the things that you perceive to find your value in at any given moment. Right Again, you, if you think that you find your value in those physical things, you're going to be unfulfilled, unsatisfied, because at any given moment, those things that you see as giving your life value can be taken away from you. And then what does that say about who you are? King Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, reflected on his life in this way, and he concluded everything about his physical life was useless. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So even though he was an extremely wealthy man who seemed to have everything a person could want to find value in physically, I mean, he had 
uh, wealth, he had possessions, he had relationships, he had fame, he had knowledge, he had, he had it all. And so if he had been like so many and, and found his worth in those things, he would have, should have, found more worth than anybody who was living at that time and probably anybody who has lived since. But yet here he is in Ecclesiastes and he looks at all these things and says it's all useless. It's all useless because it's all just temporary. Instead, he concluded that the only thing that mattered was whether he feared God and kept his commandments. In chapter 12 of the same book in verses 13 and 14, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commands because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. That's the only thing that actually matters. And he came to that realization in his life, and we need to learn from that. The physical standards are deeply flawed. But let's think about some common physical standards that people do use to measure their sense of worth. Because even though we shouldn't use those things, most people do. And so I want you to consider the following just as a sample of things that, physical things that many people use to determine their worth. Okay, think about money. People determine how much value they have by, and we even use the term sometimes, net worth. Right? How much money do you have? And a lot of times in society, the people with more money are viewed as being more valuable than people with less money. Or possessions. Again, that goes into net worth as well. It's not just the money you have, but also what kind of stuff do you have? Your house, your car, your different assets that you have. And a lot of people will find their value by what they have, how much they have, what quality of stuff they have. Some will find their value in their family. What are their family's accomplishments? How um, are their family, how is their family perceived by other people? How fulfilling are their family relationships? Different things. Or your career. What kind of career do you have? Is it, is it one that is looked upon very honorably? And is it a prestigious career? Are you climbing the ladder of that particular career or whatever? Or your friendships. All right, how many friends do you have? How quality are those uh, friendships? Are you friends with maybe people in high places and such things? Or your education and your knowledge? How much do you know? How little do you know? Where did you go to school? What kind of formal education do you have? What kind of degrees do you have? What institutions did you get those degrees from? Or your pleasures. How much fun are you having in your life? Are you really just doing the things that you find to be very enjoyable and, and such things? Or maybe it's your appearance. Sometimes people find their value in how they look and how other people think that they look. Or their prestige. How many people look at them with great admiration because of different things in their lives, and maybe they use some of these other factors. Do people hold them in high esteem? Or maybe are they just kind of common, ordinary people? Or their experiences. What has happened to you in your life? Whether good or bad can both have an impact. Have you really had a lot of experiences in your life to tell about that are positive, that kinds of experiences maybe that other people would love to listen to and things like that or accomplishments what have you done in your life where have you been who have you where um, what have you accomplished what is it that what kind of difference have you made in your life that people are still talking about perhaps maybe in your career or your education or whatever humanitarian political? What are your skills? Can you do something that maybe not very many other people can do that sets you apart, that gives your life value? 
or even your own satisfaction. How pleased are you with your own life? How satisfied are you with who you are? And those kinds of things. And, and there are undoubtedly many other standards that people use of a physical nature to try to measure their worth, but those are a few. And if you think about it, perhaps as I was going through that list, perhaps those are the very things that you have used to try to assign some kind of worth or value to your life. Certainly, it is true for much of the world. And whether you have much or little of those things, right, your value is often um, seen through the lens of those particular things. But as we think about these standards, let me talk for just a moment here about lives that are built on sand. What happens as people build their sense of worth by using such physically focused standards of value is like building a house on sand. And you look at this life, okay, from another person's point of view, and maybe it just looks wonderful from the outside. Just a wonderful house, and things look like it's, it's really together, and different things. Other houses maybe don't look quite as nice, and, uh, but, they're, but they're working to become like this one, or whatever. And the house may look beautiful from the outside, of the person's life who is building their lives on those kinds of physical things. But the, the, the faulty foundation will simply not hold together. So when we build our lives on the things that we just talked about, those physical focus things, maybe it looks great from the outside. We put on a good show. But the foundation of that house is faulty. And so when the storms of life hit, different trials and such that we go through in our lives, the cracks start to appear in that that house. And certainly when death comes, this house completely collapses. Well, Jesus taught us about building on the right foundation in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, Jesus said. And don't do the things I say. I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and great, and the destruction of that house was great. Well, the right foundation for our lives, Jesus says, is hearing God's words and obeying them. This is essential to having, as he calls it, a well-built life. Well, this also then applies to having a well-built view of ourselves. To get to this place, how do we we get to a place where we have a well-built view of ourselves? Well, as this passage talks about, you've got to dig deep. You've got to eliminate all the faulty foundations. So go back to what we talked about and think about all those physical things that we often use in trying to establish our value. You've got to dig deep in your life and get those out. Not that you can't have those things, but that's not what gives your life value anymore. That's not what you're looking at to find meaning and purpose and value in your life, your worth. Get it out. And then you carefully lay the proper foundation God wants you to lay in your life concerning your true worth, as we'll be trying to do throughout this series. This is what I'm calling Godfidence. That's the foundation that we really need because it comes from hearing and obeying the words of God. So evaluate your life very carefully right now as we think about these standards of measurement. Have you been building your sense of worth on physical things that are temporary or spiritual things that are eternal? Well, as we think about the dangers of an unbiblical view of yourself, we need to recognize that Satan is actively trying to distort your sense of worth. He doesn't want you 
to have the right sense of worth about your life. And the sooner you recognize that there are evil forces at work throughout this world, the sooner you will be prepared not to accept all the evil messages in this world about your worth. And we're bombarded by all kinds of messages about our worth in this world. God has warned us that Satan is actively working in this world to deceive and manipulate you and me. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And he goes on in verse 16 and talks about how this um, enemy that we have is hurling flaming arrows at us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, after seeing we're in this battle against spiritual forces, evil spiritual forces that are going on, he tells us in this passage, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. We have an enemy, and he is trying to devour us, and we need to resist him. 2 Timothy 2, verse 26, in the context of trying to uh, of those who are Christians trying to reach out and help those who have been entrapped by Satan to get out of Satan's traps, it says, then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. While we often focus on all the enemies and all the threats that we face on a physical level, God warns us that there is a greater conflict that we are facing that is spiritual in nature. Satan is described as a roaring lion who is trying to devour us. And he's been successful to enslave so many in his traps. In fact, all of us at one point. Satan undoubtedly knows as he goes about this work that how you view yourself matters a great deal in determining how you live. And he will try to manipulate the way that you view yourself. So, it's naive and it is foolish to think that Satan will not be active in trying to manipulate and deceive you regarding the way that you view yourself. So, now that we know that he is active in trying to distort our sense of worth, we need to recognize then that the whole world is under his sway. Satan's not working alone to try to deceive and manipulate. The Bible teaches that he has angels um, and others who are working with him. Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus makes reference to his angels. Now, I don't know everything about how they work and how they interact with the world and different things, but I do know that they are working. And I do know that they are trying to deceive us and trying to manipulate us in any way that they can to accomplish Satan's mission. And we need to be aware of that. But the Bible also teaches that that's not even the, the, the full scope of what we've got to watch out for. Instead, we know that Satan's actively working through other people who he has been successful in deceiving and manipulating. 1 John 5 and verse 19 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. So this passage makes it clear the whole world's under Satan's sway. He, he's been effective against them. Practically everybody in this world, again, all of us at one point, but that means that the messages these people spread, those who are under the sway of the evil one, that means the messages they spread have also been influenced by Satan in some way, including their messages about how to identify your worth. And we better believe it, that other people are spreading messages that contribute to how we view ourselves and what 
it means to have value in such things. And so what this means is we must be on our guards against any message about our worth that comes from anybody other than God. In fact, Satan is trying to convince us to measure our worth by comparing ourselves to others. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Paul says, For we don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, they lack understanding. We better believe Satan is trying to, to use these other people to present themselves as standards. Like the stick we used in the, in, I used in the illustration earlier in the doctor's office. To measure ourselves by this always moving standard of those who are also measuring themselves by physical things. Paul says this is not wise. If we do that, we lack understanding. Now, take a moment and think about some ways Satan is spreading distorted messages about your worth. You must increase your awareness about how Satan is spreading messages that pertain to your worth. Because we don't have to be ignorant about the ways in which Satan is trying to deceive and manipulate us. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11 says, So that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We know how Satan works in large part. We know the channels that he often works through and the ways he often tempts us. We can learn that in the scriptures. And I want you to step back and think about how is it that messages about your sense of value, your sense of worth, are actually being spread in this world. Think of just a few with me. For one, our messages about our worth are spread through our parents. In fact, the first way we come to see ourselves is largely through our parents. And the sense of value that they instill in us. And sometimes, some parents do a great job about that. Other parents steer their children in ways that are physically focused. Other parents steer their children in completely other, uh, different directions and, and tear down any sense of worth. But certainly Satan can work through parents, especially parents who do not have a God-centered view of themselves and their children. Next, through our peers, whether that's a friend or a neighbor or a family member or a classmate or a coworker or whoever it may be in your life. In conversations with them or just observing their lives, seeing people on um, social media and different things, can communicate messages about how we should find our sense of worth. Or through our culture. Our culture's full of messages about who's really, really prestigious and worth a lot and who's not. Our culture sets these standards that people then often use to measure themselves like those sticks. That's always changing, or at least always dependent on physical things. Satan also spreads messages through the media. You think about the books you read, the things you watch on television, the things you look at on the internet or social media, the things you listen to, the music you listen to, the podcast, whatever it may be. All of these things, even if they're very, just kind of underlie the message. There are messages in there, whether subtle or very, um, very obvious, there are messages in there about how somebody ought to de determine their sense of worth. Sometimes we think we need to compare ourselves with the celebrities or compare ourselves with this person or what we see on social media or whatever. And then sometimes Satan tries to spread messages through our experiences. Maybe things we've been through that are really good that leave us with a really high view of ourselves or maybe things we've been through that are terrible and have just torn us down in so many different ways as far as our sense of having any value. But Satan works through all kinds of ways. These are just a few, 
perhaps some of the most common. Maybe there's others. And you think about in your life, what has Satan been using? Who has Satan been using to spread the messages that have contributed to your sense of worth? But then let's spend the remainder of our time thinking about what are the results? If we have an unbiblical view of ourselves, what happens? Well, an unbiblical view of yourself has consequences. We began this study in Proverbs 4, verse 23. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Luke 6, verses 43 through 45. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of, his, of the heart. So we began the study looking at these passages. And we must recognize that how you view yourself has a tremendous impact throughout your life. Like Jesus expresses here, a biblical view of yourself will result in you making decisions that are spiritually beneficial. Right? The good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. But on the other hand, an unbiblical view of yourself. If you adopt one of those many false standards that are out there, you fall for the messages, the deceitful messages Satan is using to, to distort how you see yourself, it will result in making decisions that are spiritually harmful and maybe even physically harmful as well. Right? An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. And we need to recognize this. But now let's just think very practically for a moment and think about some consequences. What are some of those consequences of an unbiblical view of yourself? Certainly you can observe so many things in this world that happen as a result of people not understanding who they really are or who they should be. Their true sense of worth and true sense of value. And maybe these things are true about you. Consider the following examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but here are some things that can be seen, that can be produced whenever you do not have a biblical view of who you are and your sense of worth. One is selfishness. Because after all, if your view, if your value is all about what you have, well, you're going to be as selfish as you can. You're not going to part with those things because parting with anything might give away some of your value and give it to another person who then might have more value than you have. And you're going to want to grab anything you can because in that you think you are then elevating your sense of worth. Arrogance is another thing that comes from this. You view yourself in physical standards. Maybe you look down on other people. Because you think, based on those standards, you're better than others. You're, in some way, superior, based on some physical factor. Covetousness is another thing that is produced through an unbiblical view of yourself. Because, again, if, if your value increases, the more you get, and uh, various things, you're going to covet everything. You're going to want all of it, because every piece you get gives you more value in your eyes. Depression is also something that comes from an unbiblical view of yourself or can come from that. Because again, you know, flip it around. This time, maybe you're the one that doesn't have as much as somebody else. Or you've been through things that um, you think have robbed you of value. Now you're in a depressed state. You don't know how to get there. You don't know how to find value and meaning in your life. Sometimes that leads to this point, and that is suicide. People just give up. They think there's nothing important. There's nothing of value in who they are to deal with the different things that maybe they've had to deal with in their lives. Or jealousy and envy are, again, consequences of an unbiblical view of yourself. Because you see other people and they may have some things, their family may be a certain way, they may have certain things you want or experiences or whatever, and you're jealous about that. You see them having something that raises their value over what you have. 
and you want it. And maybe even going to a point of envy where you want to take it away from them so you can have it instead of them. Another consequence of an unbiblical view of yourself is conformity. So maybe it is you find your value in how many people approve of you and how many people um, like you and such things. So when they put pressure on you, you're going to conform. You want to fit in because that's how you find a value is being with that particular group of people. Or fear and worry. Because after all, if your value is found in the things that you have, you should be afraid of losing them. You should worry about losing grasp on anything that you feel gives yourself value. So as you age and maybe your appearances start to fade, or you're worried about the stock market or something like that, or you're worried about sickness and different things that, that threaten to rob you of something that you find value in. Or maybe it's misplaced priorities. That's a consequence of an unbiblical view of yourself. Because when you find more value in all these physical things, then you're going to align your time and your money and your resources and your energy and your efforts and your family time and all these things. You're going to align those things toward the things that you believe give you and your family the most sense of value. And so maybe you put priorities on physical things instead of spiritual ones. Or maybe you mistreat others. That's another consequence. You mistreat others. You harm them in some way. You steal from them. You're violent toward them or whatever to try to somehow make your sense of value better and maybe destroy some of theirs. You talk bad against whoever it might be or whatever. You're trying to tear them down. Maybe you slander them. You gossip about them, whatever. Next would be self-pity and excuses. You know, maybe you just fall into this place where you just make all kinds of excuses for your behavior and so forth of why you, maybe you're not where you want to be or you have self-pity and I just, you know, my life's so terrible because I'm, I'm, I haven't met this picture, this standard that I've got in my mind. Another one might be addictions. A lot of times people turn to substances or shopping or eating or whatever it might be, drugs or sex or alcohol and various things that they can get addicted to because maybe they, they don't know how to find value in any other way or they're trying to drown out um, different experiences and they're trying to find their meaning and purpose in different ways and in ways that are not helpful or even healthy physically or spiritually a lot of times. And then finally, a harmful legacy is a consequence of an unbiblical view of yourself. Because if I develop that unhealthy, unbiblical view of myself, I'm not only is that going to be the legacy that I leave about what's important to me and various things, but then I'm going to pass it on to other people that I meet. I'm going to just be used by Satan to spread those messages, whether in my home or people I'm around in other ways. And I'm sure there are many other consequences of an unbiblical view of yourself. But look carefully at your own life and see the consequences. If you've, if you've been building your life and your sense of value on physical things, look carefully at your life and consider the consequences, the things, the negative impacts that that has had on your life. We'll close our study there. Every person has developed a way that he or she views himself or herself. And you have too. You see yourself in certain ways. You have measured yourself by certain standards. But Satan has actively been working in this world to influence people not to have a biblical view of themselves. He's worked on you and he's worked on me. Challenge yourself to honestly evaluate whether you have adopted any of these physically focused standards of determining your value. Think carefully. And if so, look carefully at your life to see that you have been building a house on sand and all the negative things that have been happening in your life as a result. Thankfully, God has given us a way to find our true value. 
as we'll be considering throughout this series.